And joining us now on the debate in Washington, D.C., Maximo Torero. He is Division Director of the Markets, Trade and Institutions Division at the International Food Policy Research Institute. In New York, New York, Lisa Dreyer, Director of Food Security and Development Initiatives at the World Economic Forum USA. In our nation's capital, Kevin Thiessen, Senior Program Officer for Agriculture and Food Security at the International Development Research Center. And with us here in studio, Harriet Friedman, Professor of Sociology, Geography and Planning at the Monk School of Global Affairs. And John Cranfield, Professor in the Department of Food, Agricultural and Resource Economics at the University of Guelph. Okay, we have no time left for discussion because we spent it all giving your titles. I've never seen people with such long titles. But we thank you for joining us tonight, uh, both here in the studio and in Points Beyond, for what we think will be an important uh, first of three-part discussion on the notion of how we're going to handle going from the population we have today to what we anticipate it will be in the year 2050. And to get us started, Michael Smith, if you would, bring up the first graphic. Thank you. And let's look at some of the numbers. Population today, 6.8 billion, the estimate from a couple of years ago now, looking at a population north of 9 billion in the year 2050. How many of those will be in hunger? The United Nations, from whom these numbers come, suggests fewer. 925 million now, as opposed to only 400 million in the future. The world will be becoming increasingly urbanized. Half of us live in cities now, moving to 70% by the year 2050. Cereal production in tons, 2.1 billion today, 3 billion in the future. And how about meat production in tons? 270 million today, almost twice as much in the future. However, to meet the growing population, the UN estimates the overall agricultural production increase needed will be 70 percent. We're going to try to find out whether we can do that between now and 2050 on this program. Maximo, let me go to you first. You've heard those numbers. What do they suggest to you in terms of what we've got to accomplish over the next few decades? Sure. What it, it suggests to me clearly is that we will be facing a positive trend of, of prices, <laughs> uh, a trend, uh, which means that we need to be prepared for that. That doesn't mean that today we don't have enough food uh, to supply, but clearly we need to increase the productivity and the yields. And that is very important uh, and it's is important also to find a way in which more countries are producing more excess supply to be able to export to countries which are net importers so that we can satisfy their demands. Lisa, today, those numbers also uh, seem to say that we are going to be better able to feed people in the year 2050 than we perhaps fear today. Would you agree with that? Yes, uh, not necessarily. I think that those sorry, sorry, Massimo, let me get uh, uh, Lisa on that one. Sure, Steve. We hope that will, in fact, be the case. Um, we believe there's a great deal of potential for improving food production and doing it in a more sustainable way. But that's not going to happen on autopilot. We can have that positive future and that progress if we make a real effort to coordinate our efforts and produce more with less. We need to produce more food more efficiently using less environmental resources. And we're going to discuss how we're going to do that, in fact, over the next uh, half an hour or so. Kevin, as we look towards the year 2050, that graph also suggested we're going to become much more urbanized. What does that mean, in your view, in terms of our demand on our agricultural systems? Well, it's going to mean that, basically, as the two previous speakers said, we need to sustainably intensify agriculture. We need to, to grow more food on less uh, on the same acreage using less resources. This is the key thing that we are looking at at IDRC right now in terms of doing research, in terms of working with smallholder farmers in, in, in developing countries, and how can we actually in sustainably increase food production using less resources, using everything more efficiently to get the food into the cities. Harriet, here's a Mahatma Gandhi quote. There's enough for everyone's need but not for everyone's greed. If the billions in the developing world want to have diets similar to the ones that we have in the developed world, is that on? Probably not. The ecological footprint people say we'll need several planet Earths, planets Earth to do that. Um, also, I, one of Massimo's uh, colleagues at IFPRI has done interesting modeling on what would happen if we reduce the amount of meat consumption in the rich countries while allowing livestock products to be increased for the people who need it, who are deprived of it. And he has two different models of that reduction, which would reduce the cost of our health care services, increase the health of our populations that are over-consuming right now. And so we shouldn't take that for granted. I also think we shouldn't take for granted the urbanization trend. 
that uh, you we mean need. You don't think it'll happen? Well, it depends on our policies now. Hmm. That we are in the last phase of evicting people from the land, and the hum human species has never gone this far in this uncontrolled experiment before. Hmm. That if we support fa small farmers to improve their livelihoods, which was also the best way to improve food security, and if we increase the status and esteem within wi with which farmers are held, uh, we could solve a lot of employment problems, a lot of food security problems, and if we do it the right way, a lot of sustainability problems. Okay, John, too. let me get you on that on that Gandhi quote. We've got enough for everybody's need, but not enough for everybody's greed. You agree? Uh, yes and no. I think the issue of, of having enough food is certainly true. We, we've got enough food at a global scale. I'm not necessarily convinced that we have enough food in the right places where it's needed in order to feed everyone. And perhaps that does speak to the issue of greed. Uh, the flip side of this is also um, what we have to understand in looking forward is not just population growth, but also income growth and how that affects demand for food in different parts of the world. I want to talk, Maximo, about food prices for a moment here because I think we've all been reading the stories uh, certainly a couple of years ago and now once again most recently about how food prices in some parts of the world are spiking in a majorly significant way. Why is that happening, Maximo? No, basically what is happening is that it varies by commodity, of course, uh, but what is happening is that the production of, of the major cereals is highly concentrated. So you have few countries which are the responsible of the, of the biggest amount of the exports of those commodities. So for example, in rice, only four countries will be responsible of 90% of, of the exports. Therefore, if something happened in any of these countries, like what happened in Australia, what happened in Russia, in the case of wheat, Russia is 11% of the share of exports, then automatically that will put more pressure on prices. Linked to that, you have the issue of low stocks. So especially in corn, we are, be, we are facing uh, low stocks, historically low stocks. So any, any shock that will happen in any of those few countries that are the major exporters will automatically create an effect o over the prices. <laughs> and at the same time, uh, in some of the commodities, especially in, in corn and wheat, there is a competition for the land and water because of the biofuel policies, which is again creating a, a, a more, uh, more pressure over, over, this, over the demand, which will, of course, affect, affect prices. Harriet wants to follow up. Yes, I think the, to follow up on the meat issue, most of the grain, most of the corn, certainly, that's being produced and most of the soybeans are fed to animals now. And we need animals as part of sustainable farming systems, but it would be fewer animals integrated in a different way without grain going to them. So now, the greed question, if you want to call it that, um, is that we are feeding grain to animals and now to our cars. And that's at right. the same time, we have an unsustainable agricultural system that's dependent on fossil fuel input. So it's nuts, you're saying? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, as I, uh, le let me suggest, uh, Kevin, as I read an excerpt here from the UN Food and Agricultural Organization report, let me get you to comment on this excerpt first. The world's hungry are not just numbers, they are people. Poor women and men struggling to bring up their children and give them a better life, and they are youth trying to build a future for themselves. It is ironic that the majority of them actually live in rural areas of developing countries. Indeed, over 70% of the world's extremely poor, those people who live on less than a U.S. dollar a day, live in rural areas. That's a billion people, and four out of five of them are farmers to some extent or the other. Kevin, how is it that farmers are going hungry? Well, that, that, that's, it's an excellent quote, and, and I mean, it, it's true, and, and this is one of the reasons why we need to work with, well, why it's so important to work with smallholder farmers in, in developing countries. And why are farmers going hungry? Because right now, we, we need to design cropping systems that are tailored to the different regions of the world. You know, we, we have, if we're going to be breeding for better crops, we have to implement better soil fertility mechanisms. But at the same time, if we're increasing <coughs> yields for smallholder farmers, we need to look at the markets. Where are they going to sell these crops? And if they're going to have higher yields, what about some of the, the, the losses? We, the losses that we have with spoilage. Right now, we are producing, in, in many areas, we're producing more than enough grain, but we're losing 30, 40% of that. So hmm. one of the things that we haven't talked about here yet is one of, the, what, one of the, the reasons we're in this state right now is because over the last 30 years we have had cheap food. And as a result, we've put less and less money into agricultural research and agricultural development. And as a result, now we're in a place where we're trying to catch up. But research takes time. 
And that's why we have to start working on it now and developing these, whether, whether you want to call it an evergreen revolution or multiple green revolutions or, or multiple greener okay. revolutions, well, whatever, whatever, whatever it comes up Let me up go to with. Lisa on this. We then. have to look for... Let me follow up with Lisa for a second, Kevin. Then, okay. If you say we've had cheap food for too long, Lisa, are we talking about a future where we all have to pay more for food? That may be part of our future, and what we'd like to see is that some more of that, um, that price increase is going to the farmers. Because going back to the quote that you mentioned before, a lot of those smallholder farmers are the hungry that we're looking at today with nearly one billion hungry people worldwide. And those are people that live in ru remote rural areas. Uh, they often have very few roads, um, no bank, uh, no phone service, no well. Um, a lot of the farmers in Africa, ma the majority of the farmers in Africa are women, and these are women that are out in their fields with wooden hand hose trying to feed their families from what they can scrape from the soil with no irrigation, just hoping it will rain. So you can see all the problems that a, a farmer like that is facing. And a lot of what we'd like to focus on is getting better tools into the hands of those farmers, both literally in terms of some better tools to farm with, but also they need financing, training, uh, better land rights, a lot of support that uh, would enable them to dramatically increase uh, the food that they're able to produce, not only for themselves, but for their broader community. In which case, John, by virtue of their rural existence, it sounds as if their rural existence is part of the reason why uh, they're going hungry. And if increasing urbanization is what's ahead for the next, f admittedly, you say, Harry, mm -hmm. it's not a slam dunk, but if it's, mm -hmm. if it's more than likely that that's going to happen, that's going to help solve that problem, will it not? Uh, it, it may and it may not. It depends on whether or not people can afford to migrate from the rural countryside into urban cities and whether or not they have greater economic opportunity when they get into those urban cities. I think about countries I've worked in, in, in Ghana as an example, and I look at the people in the poor countryside and the poor who live in the main cities. And there's not a big difference in terms of their ability to feed themselves. It's a question of whether or not they have access to markets and access to employment. Harriet? It's also a question of who's going to grow the food. Mm -hmm. I, uh, there's a linear progression that's true that's been going on but how far can it go i once met a farmer who was one of the first eu farmers to be trained in growing biofuels and anticipating those subsidies and he said oh there's no problem we're going to get plenty of income from biofuels and i said well who's going to produce the food he said oh i never thought of that <laughs> and that's what happens when you go a certain way down the road of industrial farming lisa let me try this with you almost 70 percent of the world's food comes from I'm told, farms smaller than four acres. What are the top challenges faced by the so-called little guy running the farm? Well, I was describing a bit about the, the African woman in the field with her hand hoe. Uh, she's facing a tremendous challenge, and there's uh, the majority of farmers around the world are smallholder farmers. So part of making the food systems work in the future means finding solutions for those smallholder farmers to be able to produce more. One thing that our organization has been working, for, uh, working on uh, with a group of global leaders around the world as well as farmers leaders is something we call the New Vision for Agriculture, which says that in the future our food systems should provide not only food security and environmental sustainability, but also economic opportunity for those small farmers. Hmm. And those three things should be equally important, and we believe they can be accomplished together. And just let me follow up. Uh, four acres, uh, is that the right size or should they be bigger? Should they be smaller? What works <clears> best? Uh, the larger sizes are more efficient, but we have to work with the reality we've got. Sometimes that's just half a hectare, gotcha. the size of somebody's backyard Can in, I in uh, Canada or the U.S. Yeah. Go ahead, Maximo. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. But, but the issue is the difference between today and when the Green Revolution took place is that at that point uh, the scale was not so important because you can, we knew that the smallholders could increase productivity. Today, the scale is important. You have some economies of scale problems. It's no longer scale neutral because of the standards of food and, and the quality standards you need to comply with. So it's very important to find ways in which we can create collective action among smallholders and also to do contract farming arrangements with fruit processors so that they can comply with that level of scale they need to be able to link to, to the dynamic and the modern markets. So that's the way in which we can integrate the smallholders through innovative contract farming arrangements and through farmer associations so that they can comply and they can connect to the dynamic markets. Harriet. I think it's important at this point to deconstruct what we mean by food. So the great successes in productivity have been in grains, and they were so successful and so highly subsidized that they led to the production of li intensive livestock that we have now. The farmers of the Global South do not have to reproduce our mistakes. We're depleting all the natural conditions 
uh, and we're causing health problems by this industrial form of farming. What's on offer for contract farming in the Global South now is supplying what we lost, which is fresh fruits and vegetables, shrimp, uh, aquaculture, and they are, it's not clear, it's not at the expense of their own food systems, their own uh, food security regionally and nationally. Okay, John, if I heard Maximo correctly, though, he sounded, it sounded as if he was saying, I don't want to oversimplify, but it sounded as if he were saying, bigger's better. In the, in the next world, bigger's better. Well, I, I think that's true, and I do have to disagree with Harriet to some extent. What we have to realize is that as uh, farmers in some of these countries adopt the technologies that are coming onto the marketplace and that we've, we have developed here in Canada and in North America and the West, um, what's going to happen is that their cost of production is going to go down as their scale increases. And there's a natural gravitation to the, for these producers to actually get bigger as they start to see their cost of production going down. Why that's important also has to do with what we've seen in the long run with respect to global food prices, which certainly in the Western uh, countries has been that global food, or food prices have tended to fall. And so that squeezes the margin, and so that gives an economic incentive for a producer to get bigger as a means of survival. Kevin, you want a word on this? Yeah, I think I, I, one of the things we, we are going to have to do as we're, as we're designing these systems, we need to look at wor what works best under the local conditions. So whether it is organic systems or, or more modern technology systems, what is that middle ground that we can actually find to tailor it best to the farmers that are there? Mm -hmm. John, tell me this. Do we in this world have arable land that we are not yet farming? Uh, it depends on what part of the world you're talking about. Uh, certainly within the context of North America, we've done a very good job of getting the crop, uh, as our old butts once said, from fence post to fence post. Maybe not the best person to quote, but that was the mantra of, of agriculture in Western countries in the 70s. This is the former U.S. Former US agriculture, uh, agriculture secretary, secretary, secretary. Who had other issues. Uh, uh, that's right. That's right. Here. Um, and so I think we've been very success successful in getting... Um, crops planted fence post to fence post, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's going to be the best thing for agriculture. Harriet has raised some issues that I think are important, which is uh, the relationship between uh, environmental sustainability and those cropping systems. We've certainly learned from the mistakes in the past, and a good example of that would be the development of no-till agriculture, where we no longer disturb the soil as much as we used to, and we've got a considerably less erosion. So mm -hmm. while I agree that we can't necessarily export the technologies that we've developed in the West, I do think that we can do some cherry picking in terms of those technologies that are most suitable to the agroclimatic conditions in the global South. Hmm. Well, if we're, Maximo, let me try you on this. If we are, in fact, farming, certainly North America, virtually all of the arable land that we can, what is stopping getting the food to the people who now need it? What's preventing that from happening? No, look, uh, just go to a country. You, you go to, to Guatemala, Guatemala in Central America, and the northern part of Guatemala is the one that has the most, the most of the production of the country. And you have in the west part of Guatemala, uh, a few kilometers away, uh, there is a huge level of, of malnutrition. And why? Because there is a huge lack of infrastructure. If you go to Africa, the same happens in the Horn of Africa. So there is a lack of access because of infrastructure on one side in Africa, there is a need of $19 billion of investment per year to be able to cover the needs of, of, of infrastructure. The gap is around $40 billion. But at the same time, there is also a lot of, of problems of, of, of trade barriers. We have seen uh, in the last years that any, any shock on, on prices, automatically the response of countries is to put export bans and restrictions. And sometimes, even for humanitarian reasons, you cannot move produce from one location to the other. So those issues need to be resolved, and that's why it's so important uh, to move ahead with the uh, Doha round uh, and to try to find ways in which we can avoid those types of barriers. And at the same time, there is a clear need to increase investment in infrastructure, but do a smart investment in infrastructure linked to development domains. So when, when we know there will be high yields and high productivity. In which case, Lisa, let me follow up with you now on the first answer you gave, which is, if we're going to need 70% more food production between now and the year 2050 in order to feed a population of this planet that's north of 9 billion people, how are we going to do it? That's the really tough challenge that's facing the world, Steve, and uh, we've been working with a number of organizations to try to tackle that. One of the untapped resources that we think that can really help solve this problem is the power of business and the private sector. Uh, we've been working with a whole range of companies that feel they have a lot of tools and uh, business practices that can help both raise production and also expand access to nutritious foods. Uh, so business has a lot of solutions that it can bring to the table to help solve this problem. But at the same time, business can't do it alone. 
Um, so part of what we have been working on is trying to create partnerships and collaborative efforts so that all the organizations, government, farmers, business, and NGOs, and others, who are working on a particular value chain or operating in a specific agricultural region can work together to try to improve that food production and uh, according to their own goals that they may set themselves. And just so I'm clear, when you say business, I presume you're talking Archer Daniels Midland, Monsanto, uh -huh. I mean these kind of folks? We're talking about everything from the largest global companies down to a small farmer who grows a bit of extra and takes it to the market. So we think of the private sector as everything from those very small scale entrepreneurs up to the big companies. Each one has a different type of knowledge or talent to bring to the table in making the agriculture system work. Okay, Kevin, if that's the $64,000 question, or maybe I should say if that's the 9.1 billion population question, what's your answer to it? We have to start small. We, you know, that, that is the, we don't know what the future is going to hold, but we can try to design systems now that will lead to more sustainable agricultural system. And right now where we can make the, where we can have the biggest impact is with smallholder farmers, in particular with, in Africa. Right now farmers are growing, you know, perhaps yields are about 25% what they could be. So by increasing, getting better seed, looking at research into better cropping systems, we have ways that we can start to develop the, the overall production side of it. But then, as people have said, linking it with the markets. The, it, this is a huge issue, but this is where organizations, various organizations and organizations like ourselves are working with researchers in Canada and developing countries to come up with some of these ideas. Okay, John, we've heard the private sector's got to play a role. We've heard the small producer has got to play his or her role. You want to throw another idea on the table at how we're going to get 70% more agricultural production before 2050? Well, I, I think it's about the institutional arrangements that also link those, those different stakeholders together and making sure that we've got some sort of an arrangement where the institutions can facilitate the collaboration that's needed. Which institutions? Um, it, it could be anything ranging from uh, the institutional structure within a country that deals with sanitary and phytosanitary regulations or institutions dealing up, up to the scale of the World Trade Organization. If those institutions aren't structured properly, uh, it doesn't matter how innovative the, the big farmer or the big company is, trade may not necessarily happen or the right product may not get to the right place at the right time. Are they right, structured properly right now for your... Oh, I, I think all of these institutions could be improved in some way, shape or form. It's a question of figuring out which institutions are the priority area in terms of trying to facilitate uh, a more a quicker uh, response by the industry to, to dealing with this problem head on. The one point I do want to make, I think, that's important is a lot of people get really uptight when they hear about innovation in agriculture. That's what we're really talking about and how there's been this decline in government investment in innovation. Uh, that's true, and they get worried that this means that there's scope for a big, big company, that the big industrial boogeyman comes in and starts spending a lot of money on, on innovation. The simple fact of the matter is that farmers for <coughs> eons have been very innovative. And biological innovation is actually one of the underlying driving forces, I think, that could affect our ability to get that 70% increase in production. Looking at helping those small scale farmers understand what they need to do on their farm so they learn from their own experiences. Red Fife wheat is a great example of that in Canada mm -hmm. where the, the wheat that we grow in Western Canada has its origins in one plant that survived outside of Peterborough, Ontario that was resistant mm -hmm. to rust, identified by one farmer. And, and so I think that biological innovation by those small-scale producers is really, really important in all of this. Harriet, what do you want to put on the list? Red Fife was developed in public sector originally, and then it was almost lost because of the narrowing of the genetic base of our crops by increasing the scale. And uh, we had simple varieties, which are part of the problem now. What we need is resilience and biodiversity. So I think it's important to... I, although I agree with what everyone says, it, as, is it at a certain level of abstraction? There are different trajectories on offer right now. One is the big scale focusing on seeds, right, individual plants, and increasing the productivity of those without any sense of where they're going to go, and increasing the scale of markets. The other trajectory is starting with resilience, agroecosystems, small farmers, 
organized regionally with the help of the public sector. There's a lot of evidence now that agroecological systems can produce up to 70% increase in yields in Africa, and they are small scale but work better when they're cooperative, where there's farmer to farmer mm -hmm. exchanges, where there are partnerships. That kind of business is not the same and doesn't allow as many profit opportunities for large corporations as investing in new seeds. In which case, Lisa, is that not a solution that some of the folks you represent are all too keen on if the profit picture isn't as rosy as they'd like? I think it's not an, it's not an either or a question. I think we need both private sector partnership that will help strengthen ecosystems and productivity, as Harriet was saying, um, together with the community-based efforts. How poised are we right now, Maximo, in your view, to have that increase in productivity that Harriet referred to? I think that the major problem is that we are not looking to a value chain approach. We have some technology available that will help to increase yields, but we need first to transfer that technology and to invest sufficiently in agricultural research, not only to generate uh, better varieties, but also to improve the extension services. But without having a, a value chain approach, that will be very damaging because farmers will increase productivity, and if they are not linked to the dynamic markets, they won't be able to sell their surpluses. Right. So you need to look to all the steps of the value chain, try to find ways through institutional designs, like contract farming for high value crops, or farmer associations for staples, through warehouse receipt systems that will allow them to sell their produce also, and therefore to profit from the benefits. And that requires, at the same time, a significant investment in infrastructure. And that's where the governments have to play a role, because that's a public investment which is needed. So both public and private sector needs to play together here to be able to increase the production and access to the markets that we need to comply with the demand that we will have in the, in the 2050. Harry, do you want to come back on that? Farmers are entrepreneurs, so it's not a question of private sector or businesses. It's certainly a question of infrastructure, but there is a choice of infrastructure here. If farmers are producing a variety of crops in an ecologically founded system, including agroforestry, management of water, water retention in soils, uh, low input in terms of pollution um, that's happening now with soils and water, if they're going to do all that, then they're going to have mixed product markets, not contract farming. I think, as far as I can see, contract farming encourages farmers in Kenya to produce a field of green beans, which they can't eat or can't sell unless the Walmart checker wants it or the Global Gap checker for Europe. Right? Maximo, you want to come back on that? <laughs> yes. Uh, look, it's, it's not that contract farming is the perfect solution. We need to innovate a lot in how the contract designs are being made. That's for high value crops. But again, if I'm a small farmer and I don't have access to credit, I don't have access to inputs because the input market is highly concentrated and I don't have access to irrigation, it's very difficult for me as a small farmer to be able to cover all those market failures. And that's where a good design of a contract, a good contract design, or a very well-established institutional design for a farmer organization could help me enormously to be able to solve those problems, which right now I'm facing, and therefore is putting several constraints to my development. John Cranfield. I think Massimo's got a really good point on, on the, the role of value chains. The, I think the other thing that we need to also understand is that um, success among smallholder farmers doesn't necessarily uh, limit itself to being able to export green beans from Kenya to England. It could be selling green beans in Kenya, could. and it could be selling in the home market. And in some of these regions where you've got rising rates of a middle class, that could actually be a very important driver of economic growth and prosperity in both the rural and the urban sector. You know, what's strange is we've been talking for almost half an hour now, and the word Malthusian has not been mentioned once. And I must confess to being somewhat surprised about that, because I don't have to tell this group here, uh, I suspect there are many people watching us right now who think that a nine billion populated world uh, will bring about the kind of apocalypse that Malthus anticipated uh, whenever it was back towards the end of the 18th century. Lisa, um, how, come, how come you folks aren't as uh, fearful about that scenario as perhaps some of our viewers think you ought to be? Well, it, it, is a, it is a significantly startling scenario when you think about such a large global population demanding so much more food. And I think there's several directions we can take in the future, and it's up to us, us which one we choose. So we feel optimistic about this because we feel that if um, we're, everyone from global leaders down to local farmers um, can chart the right path and work together to achieve that, then we can reach, uh, then we can make this work. Kevin, that sounds, you know, I got to be careful how I characterize that. I think some people would call that, Lisa, uh, you know, very Pollyanna. I don't want to say that uh, you're not, you know, based in reality here. But Kevin, there are people who are going to think that a nine billion populated world can't be fed. Are they wrong? Yep. 
you know what? Right now, though, I think one of the reasons we, why we are optimistic is there are re, there are areas around the world that aren't producing enough, and there are also areas where we're producing enough, but we're losing it because of spoilage, because they're, they're not getting there. Right now, in the world, we have a, a lot of the, the, the issues that we do have are because we're not getting the amount of food into the right areas. And so if we can continue to produce more places like Africa, where there's, there, there's clearly a, a, a big growth potential there, combined with improved infrastructure, combined with improved markets, you know, we, we have a potential to do this. Okay, let me read yeah, another excerpt I could follow Yeah, Lisa, up. go ahead, please. Sorry, I'd love to follow up on that. I'm so glad that Kevin raised that point about the, uh, the wastage in the food value chains. Um, I, I, I don't think it's overly optimistic to say that there's a tremendous amount of progress we can make just with the resources we already have. If we look at the fact that in Africa, 30 to 50 percent of the food that's produced can be lost before it reaches the market or before it reaches people's plate, just because of inefficiencies in the value chain. If we look at the fact that women farmers, if they had the same access to finance, land, training that men farmers do, uh, the world would be producing 4% more food and we would have 150 million fewer hungry people. Um, we have a lot of resources that are already at our command here uh, that we could just deploy better to make a lot of progress um, with, the, with the world that we already have. So I, th I think there's a great deal that can be done. Um, even with the resources we have. No, fair point. And, and John, I'm often shocked at how much food we waste and throw out in this society as well. I mean, surely there's got to be a way to cut down on that too, isn't there? Well, there's, there's different ways that you can cut down on it. You can cut down on it by simply shopping more responsibly and thinking about what you're buying and are you going to eat it at home and not throw it out. Um, the, the food industry, I think, is beginning to start to think about the amount of food that is wasted uh, in processing, also in transportation, and also at the retail level. And so I think this is becoming a bit of an issue, and it's certainly gotten more media attention in the last year. And as that sort of rises to, to, the, to the specter of more people being aware of it, I think, I think the sector will respond. Maximo, let me try this with you. I read that economist Jeffrey Sachs has highlighted the fact that, uh, particularly in Africa, land, large land purchases by foreign countries may challenge future food sovereignty there. You want to explain how that may happen? No, I think that the, the, the important thing is that we need to uh, have a, a clear uh, protocol, a ethical agreement uh, on what means uh, in foreign direct investment in land and how that could benefit at the same time the countries and how that could benefit, of course, the, the foreign investors. The problem is that land grabbing, the, the, the concept called land grabbing, that could be what Jeffrey Sachs is referring. But there is a lot of effort right now being put by, by the CFS in trying to, to resolve this issue, to create a, a protocol, an initiative was taken by the Japanese government, so that if I do foreign investment uh, in land, is basically also to benefit the, the, the countries. It's very similar to, to what happened long, far years ago with, with mining industry. You have a lot of foreign direct investment, and initially it was a disaster. <coughs> they didn't recover the... the the, the damage they did to, to the location. So in agriculture, we have to think in the same way. We need to be very careful to have very clear rules and regulation to avoid uh, the misuse of foreign direct investment in land. John Cranfield. I, I think the issue of land in the developing world is a really important one. And, and the, the linchpin in all of this is making sure that there's appropriate property rights within those countries that allow for people to have access to buying land in a reasonable amount of time. And this is going back to the work by Ferdinand de Soto and his documentation of the time it takes for people to actually acquire property and have the rights to property. That it's, it's a mishmash throughout the entire world. And what we see in our own country is certainly not what we see in many other countries. Okay, we've got about four minutes left here, and I want to read one more excerpt from a United Nations report. Harriet, I'll get you to comment on it first. This is about the conventional farming versus agroecology. And I'm first going to ask you, when we come out of this graphic, what that means. But let's read this first. From the UN Special Report, just released last week. Conventional farming relies on expensive inputs, fuels climate change, and is not resilient to climactic shocks. It simply is not the best choice anymore today. A large segment of the scientific community now acknowledges the positive impacts of agroecology on food production, poverty alleviation, and climate change mitigation. And this is what is needed in a world of limited resources. Okay, best, quickest definition of agroecology, first yeah, of all. I'll just say Olivier de Scooter is a bright light <laughs> in the world he's right the, now. He's the guy who wrote he's that. He's the guy who wrote that. Um, it, agroecology means closing the loops. So all this food waste, it, there is no waste in nature. That's what anthropologists say. If, if it can be cycled back, is as nutrients, so it's called nutrient cycling, nutrient management. That's one piece. 
resiliency comes from that. Resilience comes from biodiversity. The shocks can be met more if you have a diverse range of crops. It also comes not so much from private property, which is, has its dangers of concentration, I think, but increasing evidence uh, from Bina Agarwal and others in India um, that cooperative farming, especially among women, is the best way to manage the kinds of resources that farmers need to manage because you can't manage a waterway on any scale without your neighbors being part of it, mm -hmm. probably without the government being part of it. Somehow, some cooperative and public sector organization that allows farmers to manage ecosystems at the same time as they're producing food. This has to be the core of it. Let me ask Lisa about that. Do you think there's enough people in the agricultural world who understand that agroecology, as Harriet says, has got to be at the core of everything they do? Absolutely, and, and part of our new vision is that the environmental sustainability of our future agriculture systems is absolutely essential. Um, so that's a concern for everybody who, who works within agriculture. Kevin, what about it? Do you think so? Yeah. You know, the, the thing is, we, we need to, having a sustainable system is about being judicious with your inputs. Whether it is, you know, if you're using fertilizers, whether it's mineral fertilizers or organic fertilizers, you go to either end, you can have great systems, you can have environmentally damaging systems. And so the, the key is being judicious, finding what works, and just using enough. Maximo, what's your view on that? I think that there is some asymmetry of information still. Uh, you see that some countries react immediately to increasing prices by increasing the amount of intensity of use of fertilizers so that they can increase in short term the yield. So I think it's important to transfer the information and the importance of this and how it is so relevant today when we have the problems of climate change. And, and what we know in consensus is that the variability of the climate will increase and therefore we need to find a way to keep uh, this, this sustainability, uh, especially in the case of the use of water. But if I look to India, for example, and the level of subsidies they have in, 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 in for pumping water from the underground, I, I will clearly disagree that everybody is aware of this. I, I think that there is a lot of information that needs to be shared to make people understand of the importance of sustainable agriculture. Okay. John, in our last minute here, how confident are you that all of you, with all of your expertise, are going to be able to feed the world of 9 billion people in the year 2050? Well, it may seem a bit trite to say it, but we've been through this before and we'll get it through it again. We, we had a we looming, been through this we've, we've had looming food crises in the past. Uh, in the 70s, the Club of Rome had uh, a view of, you know, the world is not going to be able to feed itself. And, and we were able to innovate around that problem. Even in Thomas Malthus's time, we had a view of, we've got a looming food crisis, population is growing quicker than we can feed it. We found a way of innovating around that. I fundamentally believe in the ability of humans to innovate around problems that human ingenuity can help solve these problems. You need a coordinated effort, though, and it can't be done in isolation of other efforts. Harriet, last 20 seconds. It has to be partnerships between formal science and the knowledge of farmers in site-specific locations. It cannot be top-down solutions that give a new seed that then is going to have to be fixed when the problems emerge from that seed. So agroecology is a, is a science that is about 100 years old. And it's the kind of science that we need, public sector and private sector uh, innovations and dissemination and extension. Gotcha. I want to thank everybody for appearing on tonight's program, the first of three parts. We're considering the world in 2050 and how we are going to feed and energize the world going forward. Maximo Torero from the International Food Policy Research Institute in Washington. Lisa Dreyer at the World Economic Forum USA in New York. Kevin Thiessen, International Development Research Center in Ottawa. Harriet Friedman at the Monk School of Global Affairs, John Cranfield, University of Guelph. Thanks so much, everybody.